All right. I am Matt Emery. Uh, this show is Authority Figures, where I connect with best-selling authors. On the show, we distill a book down to its finer points so you can absorb some of the featured book through this conversation and get one step closer to taking action on your own dream, whether that is writing a book for yourself or implementing some of the teaching the book has to offer. So today I have uh, Tony and Elisa DiLorenzo, and we're gonna be talking about their book, uh, The Six Pillars of Intimacy, The Secret to an Extraordinary Marriage. Welcome, you guys. Thank you for having us. We're honored to be here. Yeah, thanks, Matt. It's, uh, it's great to have you, and I, I, I love the book. I love the honesty from the very beginning of the book. I got to admit, like, you know, when we first started planning this, I thought, all right, I'm a little bit intimidated. I, you know, I'm, I'm talking to these people that just got marriage down pat. And it's just easy for them. Mm. <laughs> I wish it was just easy for us. <laughs> 25 years in, we're still learning. Yes. Yep. Yep. So I noticed uh, probably in the first 50 rough, yeah, almost 50 pages of the book, uh, they're kind of devoted to helping people see that uh, marriage is not easy. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. What, um, were you intentional about that? And, and if not, why, why is it important to, to start kind of with this frame for people that this isn't just a cakewalk? Well, I think because we live in just this hyper media, hyper um, imaged based culture, that everything is a perfect image right? Whether you're looking at somebody's Instagram stories or their reels or, you know, what they've posted up on Facebook, we see perfection and it all looks like everybody else has completely got their relationships, their business, their life together. And then we often look at our own selves and, you know, comparison is definitely the thief of joy. We look at our lives and we're like, why, what's wrong with me? Mm -hmm. Right. Why can't we figure this thing out? And specifically for us in the place of marriage. And so we really wanted to, from the get go say, Hey, we get it. Yeah. Right. You know, I, I throw out a statistic in the book that, you know, Hollywood, you know, on a, on a cast and crew, you know, those perfect rom coms have like 276 people making that look amazing. Yeah. And, and if I had somebody, even just doing my makeup on a daily basis and my hair and maybe making sure the lights and that Tony was perfectly scripted all day long, I'm sure we'd, you know, like it would be so much easier. But instead, it's got to yeah. be the two of us doing the work. Yeah. And we wanted people to just hear from the beginning, like, it's okay if you have to invest time and energy into making this be great, because all great things take time and energy. Yeah, I, lo I loved when I read that. And of all the pages that are, are dog-eared, folded over, that was, that was one of them. I got a good laugh out of that. Like, that's a, that's a really good point, you know, in these perfect love stories that, uh, that just seem so grateful or graceful, rather, it's... Um, yeah, a 237 person effort. It's awesome. Yeah. I, I, uh, how about you, Tony? Uh, any, any thoughts on, on that? I think from the beginning for Elisa and I, we always wanted to be open, honest, and transparent. Mm -hmm. And so that's who we are. And starting the book that way, I think allows our reader to go, okay, Tony and Lisa understand where I'm at. Mm -hmm. They understand what I'm going through and we're here to be along that journey with them. Um, mm -hmm. And so for us, and, and as Elisa wrote those words in those chapters, it was just going, hey, we're gonna be open, honest and transparent with you. So that way you can do the same as you're reading this and starting to look at yourself going, okay, how can I have transformation? How can I have breakthrough? Um, and just starting it off like that, I think just gives people hope and encouragement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's such a natural thing to get stuck in the mud at some point in life. Uh, and then I think sometimes people are able to say, oh, you know, what? I'm, I'm not where I want to be right now. So let me see why. Okay, I'm stuck in the mud. Well, what do I got to do to get out? And it's also really natural for people to say, well, I'm not the type of person that would get stuck in the mud. You know, I'm too smart for that. Mm -hmm. And it's not possible for me to... You know, for that to be true for me. So, and then the problems get worse and worse and uh, yeah. And they're never really, really addressed. So like you guys are obviously smart and uh, 
intelligent people and started out with this marriage or it started out with this relationship that was on fire. And then how did it, how did it slowly get to this point where you felt like, you know, from being madly in love, can't keep your hands off each other to being roommates? Oh yeah. That was, that it was like, you know, this total slippery slope, right. Where, you know, it's so easy when you're dating to, to have the time, you know, you don't have all the responsibilities, that type of thing. And then, you know, our first decade of marriage, we, I don't even know how many times we moved. So there were multiple moves Mm -hmm. in different parts of the country. We, you know, had three children, but had lost one in the middle. Um, We had, you know, dealt with pornography. We dealt with all of these challenges and what we had thought, and in all honesty, part of the reason why we wrote the first 50 pages of the book is because, you know, we got married thinking, well, how hard can this be? We love each other, <laughs> please. <What else? laughs> We're going to be one of those people that aren't going to get stuck. I mean, it was just a lot of pride and ego, like not going to happen to us. And then all of a sudden we find ourselves as this slippery slope, it, this gap keeps widening, getting into a place where we're like, this is, this is not what I signed up for. Mm-hmm. It, it's almost like the frog in the boiling water like you put the frog in the water you turn up the heat the frog doesn't move it doesn't notice that it's getting hotter and I think that's what ended up happening to us is you're in this and the heat keeps getting turned up and the water gets hotter Mm -hmm. but you you don't notice it so you're just sitting there and there's a lack of emotional intimacy there's lack of physical intimacy that begins to happen in that gap begins to widen and more cracks begin to to show up but you don't really want to see it you don't want to see that pillar leaning anymore you so you just sort of like walk around it um eventually you just get to a place where you're just going like this is this is all just leaning and yeah house of cards and so we're gonna have to do something drastic or we're gonna just continue to live this way and that's not where we're called to be Mm -hmm. i really i really like the imagery of pillars there's See if I can flip right to it or if I even took it down. Uh, Oh, page 150. Perfect. I wrote it down. There's, um, you said the more connections, or this is Barbara DeAngelis, but you you quoted her. It's uh, the more connections you and your lover make, not just between your bodies, but between your minds, your hearts, and your souls. The more you will strengthen the fabric of your relationship and the more real moments you will experience together. Um, I think the reason I I like the pillars analogy is you know you're, you're building something of a structure uh and these pillars are are its support and you get to this point where you have like this um this this mansion almost and when you're describing like sometimes there's these rooms almost that they just get so messy and cluttered and there's just so much stuff that you're hiding away in that you don't want to see it anymore it's like next yeah. thing you know there's there's a facet of the person that you that you're married to that you you're just you're not even going in that room you're not even exploring that space anymore you just I don't know if you don't want to look at it you can't look at it maybe even yourself on some level and so as disconnected as you are from your spouse like you're kind of becoming disconnected from yourself it's a it's a very unhappy unhealthy disposition without a doubt yeah absolutely it is and it's one of those things that that I think in in a society, in a culture that says it's all about being happy, right? We, we live in this place where if you're not making happy, then I should go on to the next person or the next relationship or the next car or the next whatever. And, and instead saying, you know what, can I, can I restore the value? right? Can we rediscover if we go on this journey together? It's why, you know, the six chapters in the book that specifically deal with the pillars of intimacy, I'll have a section that says, what can I do? And what can we do? Because yeah, you've got these rooms to use your analogy where you're not going into, maybe you stopped being curious about your spouse, but it, it, there's always action that can be taken. And if we yeah. start opening those doors, if we start putting a little you know, more strength into those pillars, then all of a sudden the entire atmosphere shifts, the environment shifts, mm-hmm. but it comes from this place of taking action, not sitting back, kind of being in this woe is me and, and there's nothing I can do. It's saying, no, wait, what can I do to affect yeah. Why do you, why do you think people do get to this point where they, uh, they like doubt that they can feel good with their partner again? Um, it's like they, 
they just I don't know that maybe they want it but they start throwing around the d word uh you know and maybe starting to look for that new thing how does that how does that how to get to that point well a lot of it too I think is societal like we just get married like there's so much put on to the wedding day mm -hmm. there's so much put on to oh my gosh you're dating now you know whatever the 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 lines are or the the number of steps now like when we when we first met 28 years ago it was like all right you're dating now it's like oh we're talking we're exclusively talking now we're dating and then you go from there and then it's like oh my gosh we got engaged and it's just like this big hoopla and then it's like oh my gosh everything's about the wedding and so we get to the wedding and it's like that's the starting line and unfortunately in our society so much is put on the wedding and, and elise and i speak to this when we we know folks that are getting engaged where we're like that's the starting line mm -hmm. there's going to be some work you're going to have to put in there's probably going to be mm -hmm. a lot of work you're going to have to be put in what ends up happening a lot of people get married and then they sit back it's like oh it, it's just supposed to work out and what we've learned over the years is that no you're going to have to be intentional in every single one of, of those pillars of intimacy and you're going to have to take action in them mm -hmm. because if not i mean if i just leave my lawn to what it is and just it, it's just gonna it's gonna grow it's gonna work like it's gonna do its thing there's gonna be weeds 10 feet tall i'm yeah. gonna have to get out and it's just it's not gonna be pretty it's not gonna it's not gonna be what i expect it to be but that's i think a lot of times what people do they step in and they're like well it's just gonna be this and they're like but nothing's working well you're not being intentional about anything and you're not taking action in any of them so why would you expect anything different right well and yeah. i think just to piggyback on that, I think a lot of people assume that they know how to do marriage. I totally did. I mean, this is, there's no pointing fingers. I was like, like I said earlier in the interview, you know, I love Tony. He loves me. Love should be able to figure this all out. And so when we started running into challenges, you know, I mean, we've been married 25 years. So 25 years ago, 24, 23, whatever it was, it wasn't so normalized to get help. Mm. right to, to go find a marriage coach to talk to people about I mean there were marriage counselors or still are marriage counselors but it was always like oh things must be really really bad like that was kind of the overwhelming thought and so stepping into this place of wait what if we're just a little bit off mm -hmm. what if we are having trouble communicating what if what if we're starting to notice some distance in our sexual intimacy like part of what we do behind the podcast and through the book is we want to normalize this idea that Look, if you're a little bit off, get help then. Don't don't be like what the statistics say that you know, generally speaking, couples will wait six or seven years before they go get help. That's where the D word comes in. That's where the checkout comes in because they've waited so long hoping mm. something was going to change instead of saying, you know what? You know, it's kind of like if I were to get on a scale and all of a sudden I put on like five or six pounds and I'm like, oh, that's not good. Let me let me take action now instead of waiting for that to be 20 pounds. Yeah it's a whole lot easier to start changing your nutrition and your exercise if you're only like four or five pounds off right you gotta do a whole lot more effort if we've gotten to the point of 20 pounds yeah. I, I much and, and that's the kind of thing that we you know we talk about it through the podcast through the book of what happens if you start taking action and getting help mm -hmm. before it gets to the extreme yeah man um uh, as, as you were talking through that i was reminded of in a, in a past relationship, and I mentioned I'm not married, but in a past relationship, uh, sometimes we would be in the, the heat of an argument and, uh, you know, or I was falling short in some way. And I'd say my, my argument for why everything was going to be okay was I just, I, but I love you so much. And she, uh, she was famous for having these surgical, like, savage one-liners that just cut me to my core but one of one of the things that she would often say and I, I don't think i ever fully understood it was well love is just what is it love is just half the battle mm -hmm. uh have you ever heard this this expression maybe it's not love is half the battle but it's like you know love is just half the equation okay. uh and i and i guess as you were talking about the thinking that love would be everything that you needed uh, to carry you through the entire relationships. Like there's a lot of awareness that's needed. There's a lot of intentionality that's needed. Pretty much remaining constantly 
diligent and constantly present. Absolutely. And it's like even being able, you know, it's like I look at writing this book, right? I had to be diligent in, you know, word counts. I, you know, there were deadlines. I like in order to get it to, to the point where, you know, it's sitting in your hands. There was a lot of intentionality that had to go into it. If I had just hoped and wished that this book was going to get written, I mean, this this is the sixth book that Tony and I have published together. Um, I know what it looks like to hope and wish. It takes a whole lot longer to write a book if you're just hoping about it. But to get to this place in a relationship where it's like, it's not just that I love to write. It's not just that I love to get these words out, but I know that my consistent actions are going to impact other people. Same thing in a relationship. My consistent actions impact our marriage for better or for worse. If I'm consistently just a pain in his butt, that will have a negative impact. If I'm consistently doing the things that need to be done to grow our marriage, then it has the positive impact. But it's what are you doing consistently? Yeah. Are you two now living the marriage that uh, you've always dreamed about? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's taken some time though. I mean, at 11 years, we are at the point of looking at divorce for the second time. Yeah. And so it's taken us 14 years to really like dive in and go, what, what do we want? And, and how do we want to live this life? We have, mm -hmm. we have one, we have one go at this. So how do we want to live our extraordinary marriage? And so it still has its ups and downs. We're not perfect. We, we share often when, when things don't go the way we thought it was and we share when they do go, but yeah, I would say I would, I'm more in love with her now than when we got married. Mm -hmm. I'm more excited about what we get to do together as a 100%. husband and a wife now than when, you know, even 10 years ago. Um, it, it's just, it's just awesome to live where it's, it's just freeing. You know, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't worry about rejection. I don't worry about how we're talking to each other. I don't have to, I don't have to live in these places of like, do I need to think about this, this, and this? It's like, I can be Tony. I can be who I am because we've worked on each other and we've worked on our marriage together. Yeah. And we're, awesome. we're at the cusp of another, you know, pretty big life transition here in the next two years. Our youngest is going to yeah. be a junior in high school. And so we are very much, um, <laughs> she has her driver's license. So we're rapidly approaching the empty nest. And, you yeah. know, it's because we've been studying marriages for so long, we know about the phenomena of great divorce. You know, what happens when the baby leaves. leaves, where a lot of couples find themselves as complete strangers. And we're actually at a point where we're like, okay, we're not, we're not pushing you out of the nest, but we're super excited about what our life is going to look like and the relationship mm -hmm. that we've built. And that's the intentionality really of the last decade plus yeah. of saying, how do we build up this relationship, this connection? How do we learn how to speak to each other? How do we keep all of these pillars strong so that when it is just the two of us, again, we actually want to be together and we want to do life together um, and not just, you know, be roommates. Yeah. Does, uh, does parenting uh, and, and figuring out exactly how you parent fall under one of the particular pillars of intimacy? Is it, or is that kind of outside of? You know, it, that's a great question. And actually parenting will cover a number of the different pillars, right? Cause it's gonna impact your emotional intimacy, how the two of you talk to one another. It's going, especially in the early years of having, you know, little ones, um, the physical intimacy often gets impacted for couples because if mom is breastfeeding or if you, you're, you're constantly holding or something, you know, a lot of times mom feels all touched out. And so that changes the physical intimacy. Uh, parenting and the costs associated with children definitely impacts financial mm -hmm. intimacy, 100%. I mean, we've got two teenagers. Trust me, the zeros are a real yeah, thing. Even now. <laughs> you know, how a couple will, will pray together, how they'll engage in their spiritual intimacy can be impacted by um, parenting as well as recreational intimacy, how the two of you are spending time together, just the two of you yeah. when you have kids and then sexual intimacy. I mean, we tell people literally, um, you know, from the time they bring baby home from the hospital, we tell them start locking the door and getting that child used to the fact that bedroom is a sanctuary for mom and dad. And, you know, it is good and healthy for you to continue to have sex after you bring kids into the world. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you named uh, some of them. I think it's a, it's a good moment to, to recap on, on what these six pillars are. So the first one is emotional intimacy. And we start with that one because that's all of your verbal and nonverbal communication. 
how the two of you talk to one another, how you communicate your thoughts, your feelings and desires will actually impact the other five. Yeah. The next one's physical intimacy. And we separated this out with, from sexual intimacy, Matt, because so many people will be like, I want to be physically intimate. Well, that there's a really blurry line there. It's like, so we really, we separated these two going physical intimacy is that non-sexual touch. Mm -hmm. So these are the holding hands, the kisses, the hugs, all that good stuff. Can it lead to sexual intimacy? Absolutely. But this is really going, how do we strengthen this pillar by just kissing each other, hugging each other, cuddling together, whatever that may be. Yeah. yeah. That I mentioned um, financial intimacy. And this is one, you know, that people are like, did you just say financial and intimacy in mm -hmm. the same phrase? But it really <laughs> is because, you know, when the two of you get married, how you talk about money, what you do with your finances, how that is all happening throughout the course of your marriage, there is a connection, a closeness that can be built in looking at everything from, you know, what's our cash flow plan to how are we planning for retirement and everything through there. Yep. Spiritual intimacy is the next one. And that's all you, how you're getting, how are you uh, close and connected through your religious beliefs mm -hmm. and practices mm -hmm. um, from worshiping to praying together, to going to services together, to serving together. What, what does that look like for the two of you? Yeah. Number five is recreational intimacy. And this is, these are the fun things that you do together right? How do you, the two of you spend time, you know, prior to getting married, you know, when couples are dating, it's all about like, Hey, we're going to go here and we're going to do this and we're going to travel here. And the reality is that it's actually more important to continue to have fun and to make memories doing things together after the, I do, because that's where you have the opportunity to grow and stay curious and get to know and do different things mm -hmm. with your spouse. Yep. Lastly, sexual intimacy. That's the last one. And the reason we put it last, Matt, is because you really need to be working on all those other five, mm -hmm. right? Because again, this is that this is your closeness and connection around your sexual intimacy. And so this goes from romance, initiating foreplay and sexual intercourse. And we break that up too, because we want couples to understand that it isn't just sex. It isn't just let's have sex. No, how am I romancing? How am I initiating? How, how are we how are we engaging in foreplay as well as that sexual, in, uh, sexual um, intercourse? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So those are the six. Yeah. Do you, do you find, so uh, in, in reference to uh, sexual intimacy, there's things that can certainly, and you referenced this in the book, can certainly come up when engaging in that, uh, in that, in that act that like someone might be, uh, you know, want to try something new, but they might be a little bit shy about that. Um, they might just, uh, in entering that energy, like have some different landmines from their past that can be addressed. Sure. Do you find that uh, engaging in sexual intimacy can kind of be a, a tool then to help uh, each other connect in the other pillars of intimacy? Absolutely. You know, all six of them are very much intertwined. And yeah. every couple has their own unique strengths that they automatically, just by nature of who they are, bring in to the marriage. And as I've been coaching couples now for over 10 years, I will often, whether it's the sexual intimacy pillar that's strong, or maybe it's recreational intimacy or, or, or physical intimacy, I will look to a couple and say, okay, let's talk about where you're strong. And then let's use what the two of you have figured out in terms of strategy, in terms of conversation starts, and then pivot that to the pillar that you want to strengthen. Because if you're operating from a place of strength in a particular area, then you operate from a place of, I can do this, yeah. I can be successful. And that creates a tremendous amount of shift for couples uh, and indiv individuals as they look at those different pillars. Interesting, I like that. Um, in the emotional intimacy chapter, uh, you talked a lot about, about vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, Early on, uh, and, and still a little bit in, in my relationship, uh, my dialogue internally is my partner doesn't want to hear about every little thought that I have, every little emotion that I have. And it's just, it's boring. It's boring to me. So it's definitely boring to, to her. And come to find out that when I'm not communicating some of these things, uh, it's natural for her imagination to, to run a little bit rampant. And then she'll fill that lack of communication in with the, the worst case scenario. <laughs> um, so I guess talk, talk a little bit about like the importance of, of communicating even 
little things and, and the importance of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one of those things. It's easy for us to get in our heads and keep these internal dialogues going on about, oh, don't bring that up. Don't. I, I will tell you, I've sat across from countless couples the the sharing of feelings and learning how to do that and it's a skill that that is 100 skill development there that unlocks so much in terms of knowing what's going on with your partner and not stepping into that place where you're creating i mean i talk about movies a lot right you can be the most expert screenwriter if your spouse does not fill in the blanks with what they're thinking you will it, it will be <laughs> It will win every award. It will have all of the drama. It will have the highs and the lows. If you would just open your mouth and say, hey, here's what I'm thinking. And she's like, huh. And then it shuts her right down in a healthy way where she's like, oh, I don't have to fill in the blanks anymore with what Matt's yeah. thinking or with what Tony's thinking. Like, I, I can ask the question. This, this is part of that vulnerability of trusting that if you get asked the question, she actually does want to hear or he does want to hear. And, and that's something that's learned over time in a marriage of how do I share? I mean, I, I keep this thing, you know, on my desk for all my coaching. This is an emotion wheel. I will sit in mm -hmm. coaching sessions with clients and be like, okay, let's start with where, you know, the first level of feeling and let's work our way back because learning how to communicate what you're feeling brings an opportunity to connect well beyond the surface level with the person that you love. It's going to yeah. be different for each couple, right? We're not all cookie cutters. Mm -hmm. We weren't all made the same. And so where Elisa and I are strong in our emotional intimacy because of the way we're able to share that may be different for you guys or for another couple. And that's okay. That's that for us, we really believe in this emotional intimacy area. It's, it's a learned skill. Mm -hmm. You have to, you have to activate it though to learn it, to understand, oh, where are you at? What's going on? Why, what's happening there? Let's, let's tweak this. Let's do that. And knowing that again, you're on this path together and this journey together, we made a commitment. We said our I do's, we said our vows, and we're going to stick to those and go, okay, well, we're learning. And sometimes we're not going to get it exactly right. And mm -hmm. sometimes we do, but communication and your emotional intimacy, it's a learned skill. So what you think is an important, it, it could be important to her. And so it's like, okay, well, how do I express so that way I'm giving her what she wants, but at the same time, I'm not inundating her with every little thought that's happening. Cause we have something like 9,000 thoughts a day or something. Yeah. Well, and even <laughs> yeah, just about, about the, the example that you gave, you know, it's one of the things that people can do anywhere in a stage in a relationship is actually ask the question, Hey, I don't think this would be important to you, but I also know that you tell me I'm not communicating enough with you. So what does it look like for me to, to not be you know, begging or nagging or anything like that, but just say, hey, I'm having this thought about X, Y, Z. Are you in a position right now for me to share it with you? Mm -hmm. Do you want to hear about it? And it doesn't matter what the answer is, but at least now you're taking that step into building that emotional intimacy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she may be like, yeah, actually, I do want to hear what you think about, yeah. you know, traveling to San Diego or doing that as opposed to I'm yeah. just it all in my head, right? I love that. Yeah, the way that you that you said that was great. I'm having this thought about this thing right now. You know, is this a good time to share it with you? Yeah. Um, yeah. I we've uh, my my girlfriend now. Her name's Bella, uh, and we had a conversation one time where I thought, you know, I I love this space that we have for communication between us because I think we can talk about anything and everything, um, and we're so comfortable with each other. Like this this space, it truly is this 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 thing between us that has great capacity. Um, <laughs> and one time <clears throat> I said, sometimes I think we just, you know, we have this space. I think we just sometimes fill it with whatever comes into our heads. And how can we be a little bit more intentional about not, not just throwing any random thought into the space because we know we have the space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how can we not uh, desecrate the space through I didn't say nonsense, but that's almost sometimes what these thoughts are. It's just like whatever comes into my brain, just like narrating, oh, that, you know, there's a tree. You know, <laughs> you just read seven billboards in a row, like maybe <laughs> out loud. Maybe yeah. I can have some quiet time. Uh, but it is, I, I really like the way that you, uh, that you express that. Like, hey, is this a good time to, mm -hmm. you know, to talk about this? Yeah. 
It is a skill. Um, do you do you notice a, a discernible difference between uh, hey, you're making me angry, and I'm feeling a little anger right now? Well, sure. It's that you do, are doing this versus this is what I'm experiencing. And you, go ahead. No, I, yeah, I wanted to hear your thoughts on uh, how how just different w- ways of communicating can keep people open to like you know what you actually have to say. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, communication 101 says, you know, start with the I and not with the you. Um, And that's, that could be talking about anything in marriage, right? We want to, we want to keep things in a place where we feel empowered. And, you know, when we start those statements with, you know, you're making me angry, then the blame gets put on another person and we feel disempowered. Where if instead it's like, hey, I'm feeling a little angry right now then it's, it may be about something that you're doing, or it may not. I may just be having a whole bunch of emotions because I got stuck in traffic and the kids were doing whatever, but it allows me to step into this place of I'm feeling this way. What can I do about it? Right. It's not up to you to fix me. It then becomes about, I have ownership of this emotion. Mm -hmm. I have the ability to create a shift here. And if I have the ability then I'm not stuck going back to, you know, kind of what we were talking about in the beginning of the interview. Yeah. If I'm not stuck, then then we can move forward as a couple, we can move forward in relationship because there's action involved in that. And I would say when it comes to this sort of stuff too, Matt, a lot of it is environment. Mm. Where are you? What's going on? You know, when, when I was a young married, all I ever heard pretty much from amazing men and women was, you know, you're going to have this conversation and you're going to be across from one another and you're going to be knee to knee and you're holding her hands and you're gonna look deep into her eyes and you're gonna just share and I'm thinking you're out of your mind like, I did that <laughs> and I'm like yeah I mean it's like Elisa's peering deep into my soul and my hands are all sweaty now and I feel awkward and and how we're we gonna have this conversation and it, and it just for me scared me away mm-hmm. from wanting to actually engage in our emotional intimacy and so Elisa and I learned over time for us, what we call now our walk-in talks. Mm-hmm. These are, this is our place. This is where we can just go out and just, you know, the other night we went out, we, we did what a three mile walk around our neighborhood. You know, it's eight, eight thirty at night. We're just rocking and rolling. We're just talking and we're just letting it go. It's, it it's a, allows us to let the conversation flow. And, and sometimes it's just, things just pop up out of nowhere. And it's like, whoa, wait, where did that come from? You know, but it's okay because we're, we're, we're cool with that because this, this is our place where we can just pipe off some things. And how about this? How about that? Oh, that, I, that doesn't make sense. Or in, and, and we can work through those, mm-hmm. but it, it allows yeah. us to be out of this environment where it's like, Ooh, it's all contrived. And we got to say this thing and that way. And it, it's like, we're out on the beach, you know, we're, we're walking trail, whatever it is. And we've been doing that for many years and has helped us in our emotional intimacy to just allow things to flow, hear what's going on. And sometimes things just need to be said because they are swirling. And I just need Elisa to hear it. It's not that she needs to respond to anything. Doesn't need, I don't need her to tell me how to fix anything or anything. It's just, I need to get it out and I need yeah. her to hear it because she is the closest relationship that I have on this earth. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. if I can just share one more strategy with that, just based piggybacking on what Tony said, you know, there are times when you just need those random thoughts to pop through your head, right? You might be thinking about mm-hmm. a project at work or something that you've got to get done. And you're just, you might actually want to just verbally process it. And it's, it can be super helpful in a relationship. If you know that to actually state it, Hey, like you said, I don't need, I, I don't need you to brainstorm with me. I don't need you to fix it. Just the random, uh-huh, like I hear you. And, and just that listening can be really beneficial to feel connected. And then there are other times when you're like, no, actually, I need all your brain power right now. Yeah. Help me come mm-hmm. up with a solution with this. And, and so I'm going to tell you what's going on. I'm going to present it, but I want, I want your feedback. So being able to say, hey, do I need a listener or do I need you know, a problem solver actually sets up your partner for success. Because it doesn't matter what you say, the answer is right. Like you need a problem solver, be a problem solver. If you need a listener, be a listener. But if you know what your, your spouse or your partner needs and you can deliver that because they've told you, then you both feel like you're winning yeah. when it comes to building this emotional intimacy. Because you're like, yeah, done. Got it. I will just sit here and listen to you, whatever you got going on. Yep. So if you were, if you found yourself as the recipient 
of uh, of somebody needing to talk. They come at you, and let's say they skip the frame. I love I love the idea of the frame. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, I, I need this right now, or I need that right now. Um, how might you, as the recipient, uh, set the frame so that you can set yourself up for success if they haven't for you? Easy, just ask them. Hey, do you need do you need me to fix something here, or do you need me to listen? It's pretty simple. Like that. That's the problem, though, within communication. We're we're, we're afraid to say that because we're like, oh, then they're going to get all mad. It's it's pretty simple. Hey, do you do you need me to fix something right now, or do you just need me to listen to you? Yeah, I want to be. I want to be what you need. Right. I want to serve you in this in this instance and give you what you need. And I know as you didn't say like it's not it's not a slam on them. Hey, you didn't tell me at the beginning. Am I am I listening to help you solve this or am I listening because you just want to process it? And sometimes we'll get into questions like we'll be out there and we'll be doing stuff and all of a sudden like that isn't brought up at the front end. It, yeah. it, it, I mean, like, like we don't like walk out every day and we like, hey, do you, do you need me to listen? Do you need me to fix something? You know what I mean? Do you need a problem solved with you? Or that's not in a normal conversation, you're walking around, you're doing something and Elisa may be saying something all of a sudden I may just start going into problem solve mode mm -hmm. and she can go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, I don't need you to problem solve. I just need you yeah. to listen now, Tony. Yeah. yeah. It's on me to take that and be able to go, cool. Like no harm, no foul. Like I don't need to take all. It's like, not personal. It's not it's, a personal yeah. statement. It's not like you did. No, it's just, oh, wow. I didn't, I didn't realize that you didn't say that. Cool. Like, go on, like, let, let's go. And yep. we'll just keep walking and you just keep sharing. I'm here to listen. Cool. And once you need me to, once, once you need that to shift then let me know and we can shift if you want to, if not totally understand. Yeah. Man, it is uh, it really is that simple. Uh, <laughs> I, I love how simple it is. That simple uh, and that complicated it, it, all it at is. the same time. Cause, you, cause yeah. it is simple, but you actually have to do it. Right. Yeah. Right. You and, and then you have to take action. The doing is where we sometimes trip ourselves up. Yes. Yep. I like the idea of the walk and talk. It's uh, it's it's kind of denotes this the nature of the conversation. Is there's things in flux. Nobody needs to to stand and hold their ground. We're we're moving. We're growing. We're evolving. Uh, that's a that's a great idea. And it's a set amount of time usually. So, you know, maybe you're you're out for a half an hour walk. All right, cool. We're done. In a half an hour, we're done. Like we roll back in and. You know, if, if we go out for a morning walk and talk, if we go to the beach, you know, we, we go yeah, down there, we yeah. do our walk, we go, we come back, we grab a coffee, you know, for Elisa, she wants her latte, I want my iced tea, we come home, we jump in the shower, but it, it's sort of a, a set amount of time. We know when we're on the beach, that's when we're talking about this stuff. Once we get off the beach, all right, we're going to move on to other stuff in life, mm -hmm. you know, and, and other areas of what we, what we, what we're dealing. And sometimes it'll, it'll flow over, but Usually it's there mm -hmm. <laughs> we're like, all right, cool. We're good. <laughs> yeah. We're going to the good next to one. <laughs> good to have those, those tense conversations in a place with an abundance of, of calm. Mm -hmm. You know, the waves are crashing, sand under your feet. Yeah. Uh, that's, the that's breeze, great. The sun. Yeah. You, you right? just, uh, Lots to draw from. Yeah. So when you when you first started dating, neither of you had much of a, a spiritual life, much of a faith at, at all. Um, and then now you you really do, and you kind of come into that in your own way. I uh, would you care to share the story of of I guess where you would say that uh, that openness to I don't know if what you'd call it spirituality, faith began. Yeah. So we both grew up Catholic. We did. Um, I left when I was probably 16 years old and you were what, 17? I, pretty much when I went off to college. So yeah. yeah, 17, 18. And so, you know, we lived those years. I mean, we didn't know each other until I turned 21 and uh, Elisa was 19 when I first met her, yeah. but we lived all those years. Uh, and then some after we got married without any spiritual grounding other than that Catholic upbringing. Um, mm -hmm. and in 2000, I took off, we had been married for three years and I had embarked on through hiking the Pacific crest trail here on the West coast, which starts in Mexico. Um, you, you actually touched the border, uh, back in 2000, there was actually just like Bob wired fence. You could put your foot in Mexico. Um, and I hiked from Mexico to Canada, 2,658 miles on the Pacific crest trail. Um, Elisa's mom, my mother-in-law, 
gave me the Footprints poem. And it was just an interesting time because you're out alone, you're doing something that not many people do, you're enduring a lot of hardship. Um, and yet you're just seeing some of the most wild and amazing things that this, the West Coast has to offer. Um, and I'm a big fan of um, the settlement West and everything that happened in, in the 1800s. Um, so I'm just seeing all these cool things. But I remember just reading that poem so many times, so many times. And at least I started having just some conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and she'll say, share her side of the story, because even though we were married, she didn't do the trip with me. She didn't do the through like she was like, mm, no, I'm not hiking for four and a half. That's for you. Yeah. yeah. It took me 138 days to complete it. She was like, no, that I'm isn't good. Proven. I'm good. Don't yeah. Want to do that. So to have to be about 500 miles in, I met this guy named Arkansas, Dave Christian dude, probably one of the coolest guys I had met at that point in time. And um, in the, in the Sierras, just in this vastness, I was like, man, there's more to life than just me. And uh, I just remember having these cool conversations with Dave and then calling her and talking to her mm -hmm. and she was having her own experience at that same time. Yeah. Cause while he was gone, um, there was an attempted break in, in our apartment yeah. and, um, I had all these plans before he left. I'm like, okay, if anything happens, I'm going to call 911 and, and, you know, just, and literally, I don't know, like my brain short circuited. And I actually went to the door that night as these guys were like trying to bang and, and like three big, three big guys. guys. And we knew them. They were, they were just drunk in the wrong apartment, but they were yeah. conscious of that at the time. And <laughs> I was standing at the door, peering in the peephole, trying to figure out what I was going to do if these guys got in. And there was this voice in our apartment behind me that said, this is not your apartment. And so then I get freaked out thinking who got in the apartment because it's ground floor. I'm like, what's, and, and I 100% believe that that was the voice of God protecting me in that moment and because they like all of a sudden you could literally see the light bulb go on in their faces and they're like oh dude that's the wrong apartment number huh? <laughs> and I'm like oh, are you kidding like my heart's pumping out of my chest and um and the next day when I opened my front door the only thing that was keeping them out was the chain everything all like the entire door frame collapsed the minute I opened the door oh my gosh it was bad um yeah but that was my literally my come to Jesus moment where I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm here all by myself. Tony is, I don't remember where you were when that happened somewhere either. in the mountains. And, and this is a day, you know, we didn't have cell phones on the trail. You didn't, yeah. I mean, I had to get into town. Every town stop was about average four days away. Have to pick up a pay phone. Did I get a hold of her when she was at work or at home? And if she wasn't, I'm leaving, you know, a voice message. So this isn't the day and age where you're like, Hey, you know, I'm just booking along and how are you doing? Or she's texting me and I could get it because the trail has that now. Yeah. Um, but it was really, that was the start of our yeah, faith well, journey. Yeah. And, you know, Tony came home from the trail. Um, we were living in Orange County, California, and we, we started attending Saddleback Church. Church back when it was much, much smaller in 2000, 2001. And that was the beginning of our faith journey together. Yeah. which is really, you know, over the last 20, 21 years, mm -hmm. almost 22 years now, yep. um, has been a journey of learning how to pray together, you know, attending, making church a priority for us, learning how to, to worship and, and rely on God instead of just relying on us and, and really being in that place of, you know, a court of three strands. Um, not yeah. because, because there was a lot of life that happened, a From lot that. of storms yeah. that happened after we made that decision to follow Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I like that you said uh, spiritual intimacy can be more intimate than sexual intimacy. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's, it's definitely like when you hear, when you hear your spouse pray, when you know, I mean, it, it's taking that emotional intimacy and that vulnerability that we talked about a few minutes ago, but, but now like when you hear somebody pray out loud, you are, you're like eavesdropping on their conversation with God in, in a healthy way, like not in a weird way. And, and so <laughs> When you hear that and you know what they are seeking God for, when you hear their cries, yeah. you know, of God, this is, this is what we're pressing in for God. This is what we're believing for. There is this connection that happens that is supernatural. And it, it literally having your spouse connect with the creator and being witness to that. Yeah. That's like a whole nother level. Yeah. It's beautiful. 
Yeah, I, I really like that. And I and I agree. I think that that's uh, that's very true. It's like the the way I'll, I'll bear my soul to to God in ways that uh, I'm scared to do it into another person uh, or it wouldn't quite make sense to be as vulnerable with another person as I am with the Lord. Although, I mean, I, I'd love to get to that point by all means, but cool to, to have somebody who can hear that and see that and, and have space for that and, and just realize, you know, on the deepest level, your values. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's incredible. Fact, you know, there, there's stages of that too, Matt, like for Elisa and I, when we first were coming when we first came to Christ, got baptized and all that, you know, we, we, we stepped into devotions Mm -hmm. because that was a, like, give me some questions. Let's, let's read some verses. That was a really good, easy step for us to, to start with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, you know, there, there are stages and there are places where you are and, and depending on how you were brought up and what does that look like for each of you, can can be very different at different seasons and times Mm -hmm. and you you know it just depends on where you're at I mean more recently for Elisa and I um, this year in particular we were very clear around our spiritual intimacy intimacy pillar that the way we wanted to strengthen it was that we wanted to take three days a week and set aside time where we pray together Mm -hmm. and uh, we've been pretty consistent with that over this year and it's it's really been awesome um, to just be in that place with her and taking the time to go, this is this, we're going to make it no matter what's going on. Mm-hmm. My calendar goes off. She knows it and, and, and hers goes off as well. And we're just like, all right, let's go. Let, let's go. It could be five minutes, could be 15 minutes, but whatever it is, we're going to make sure we're, we're taking this time together. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. What were some of the making that decision? What were some of the emotions present uh, and maybe even motivating the decision to pray together? We, I I think we had a sense, um, I I won't speak for you, but just that, that this was a pillar that wasn't as strong as it could be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, you know, we go to church together, we've served together. You know, there are a lot of things that we do together. We started looking at where else could we bring strength to this? What could we do? And and this is something I said earlier in the interview, what could we do consistently Mm -hmm. that, you know, it's not like we're trying to cross the finish line, right? It's not like we're like, oh my gosh, we're going to pray seven days a week. And we're going to, you know, get up at five to do it. It was more like, what, where can we start with a baby step where we can have success? And we knew we, we've seen and experienced the value of praying out loud with other people. We just, you know, corporate prayer, men's and women's prayer meetings, you know, things like that. But what would it look like if we brought that into our marriage? Mm. What would it look like if it was just, you know, from a vulnerability standpoint, what if it was just the two of us, Mm -hmm. right? Praying, you know, having those prayers of praise of the good things, but also the pressing in. Mm -hmm. And how do we strengthen, you know, I I wanted to see Tony do that more, right? We talk a lot, um, you know, about just the husband being the spiritual leader of the home. And so what does that look like? You know, he almost always will start prayer. I love it. I I will close. It's totally good, but I love hearing him first and not from a place of, oh, you always have to go first. It's just that leadership role that God created him for. And so to be in that place, um, as one of my coaching clients told me the other day, she's like, I love it when my husband leads prayer because it's just that security of knowing that I'm covered Mm. by him. And I'm like, yes, that. And that's what we have and we've created our marriage. Yeah. I think it takes confidence too. And you just step into new, new places. Mm-hmm. And so I think both of us at this time in our lives, where we're at and what we, what we know we want to achieve, like we had to step into something and believe me, it's uncomfortable at first. It's like, Oh gosh, what if I say this or, you know, but just really stepping into that and opening up and being open, honest and transparent with one another has just Mm -hmm. been, it's been awesome. And and believe me, Matt, just like anything else, there are times when we forget. There are times when we're like, Hey, I thought you were coming downstairs and I'm like waiting downstairs for her and she's not showing up, but she thought I was going to come upstairs and I'm not showing up. And so we have a little bit of a breakdown. Yeah. You know, like this, but (laughs) You know, there's a, there's a, there's a little, we're just not on the same track, you know, yeah. and, and it's okay. That's what you have to work through that and go, all right, but we're on the same team. This is something we both want. Let's keep moving. And, and, and so there may come a point in time when one of us is like, Hey man, I'm good. 
-hmm. like what 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 do we want to do next uh, i'm not there and, and the other one may be like no i'm still loving this and so that may be in the future and we're going to have to address that when that approaches mm -hmm. yeah well i really admire you guys uh and the marriage that you've that you've created i i see your your playing full out in it, being really intentional in it. It's like clear that you want something extraordinary and maybe you would even define what you have right now as extraordinary, but still like, how can it be even more, you know? So I, I love the, the spirit of curiosity around things like, you know, would, could we get even deeper in our, in our spiritual intimacy this, this quarter? Like, how can we really lean into that? Um, so it's, it's really inspiring. Awesome. It's admirable. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And it's not just for us, though, Matt. I mean, we wrote the book. Yeah. So it's not about us. Like we mm -hmm. when we started one extraordinary marriage years ago, it's always been our our prayer and desire that we impact one couple. And so through the book, we found that we are just impacting one couple after another, mm -hmm. after another, that they see the six pillars of intimacy and they're like, oh wow. Like we can do this. Mm -hmm. Like we don't have to just sort of be a, a rudderless boat. Now we got a rudder on our boat and we can start driving that direction where we want to have the extraordinary marriage. So it's truly been an honor and a blessing what we get to do and, and be a part yeah. of it. Well, you're doing it all together. You've got you've got the books. I know Lisa writes a lot a lot of it. You got some Tony thoughts in there. We got with Tony. Uh, that's the editor choice. Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. like I'm confused. It, it, is Tony yeah. writing this or not? It's, it's a with yeah. Tony, which is okay with me. I was like, totally, totally agree with it. Yeah. Yep. Well, then you have the podcast. You've got, uh, I guess, share and you've got just a. A minute or so here and we'll wrap up but what are what are some of the other things that you got going on right now to help people have this extraordinary marriages well like you said the podcast we've been podcasting for 12 and a half years now um so we are we are part of that og crew of podcasters yeah. um and then you know really big focus for us is marriage coaching yeah. um we realize that you know as we've talked throughout this interview there are a lot of people that think marriage is going to be easy and then maybe it's not as easy <laughs> as we thought, or we run into those, those speed bumps or those obstacles. And so, you know, a lot of what we're focused on is how do we equip couples with the tools and strategies that they need, whether that's through individual coaching, some of our group coaching offerings and things like that to really be in this place of saying, we want you equipped. We don't, you know, it's like no marriage left behind, right? We want to see every married couple building towards their extraordinary marriage. And if you're going to build, you got to have the tools to do so. And yeah. we're just here to equip. Yeah, I love it. So if, uh, if you are interested in, and you're listening to this and you're interested in expanding your own marriage and finding all the ways you can do so, you can go to oneextraordinarymarriage.com. You can buy Alisa, A-L-I-S-A, -A, DiLorenzo and Tony DiLorenzo's book, The Six Pillars of Intimacy. Looks like you guys got, are on Facebook, One Extraordinary Marriage there. Mm -hmm. Same with Instagram. Yeah. Anywhere else that people can go to to learn more about what you're up to? I think that's perfect. That covers it. Any any uh, of those, you can find us. Jump mm -hmm. in. We'd love to have you part of the one family and uh, come alongside you for your marriage journey. Beautiful. Well, I love the book, and uh, it's given me a lot of things to to move forward with some intentionality on. So fantastic. Thank you guys. Thanks, thank Matt. you. Appreciate. Thanks for being on.